Hi, my name is Bob Grinier and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. Alexander Parkamov sent me an email uh, yesterday afternoon uh, reporting that uh, he had finally got his uh, paper, his uh, sort of uh, theory paper published uh, and uh, wanted to let me know and it's published at uh, www.unconv-science.org pdf-23-parkamov1.pdf and uh, I've been waiting for this for some months and so uh, I'm very happy to report that I couldn't wait to uh, see if there was an English version. I went ahead and did a translation and uh, we have that here and uh, I'm going to read uh, this through to you uh, and uh, it may not be the most perfect translation. Uh, I sent it back to Alexander today and he said there is a uh, an English translation in review and uh, that will be published later, but I think probably you will get most of what's uh, needed out of uh, this translation. So, Lena as a manifestation of weak nuclear interactions, A.G. Parkamov. The small neutrino, antineutrino mass, makes it possible to generate them intensively as a result of collisions of particles of matter during thermal motion. The resulting neutrinos, or antineutrinos, have an energy of about 0.1 EV, with such an energy, the de Broglie wave wavelength is about 5 microns. This means that a huge number of atoms are involved in nuclear weak interactions, which makes the effects of nuclear transformations involving neutrinos or antineutrinos really observable. Considering the thermal generation of neutrinos as the basis for nuclear transformations in the Lena process uh, allows us to explain a number of features of the phenomenon. Uh, now, this may not be a perfect translation, so uh, just bear with me. Uh, introduction. An extensive class of phenomena that are called low-energy nuclear reactions, LENA, or cold nuclear transmutation, CNT, that's the sort of uh, Russian uh, name for the process, or cold fusion, are neither low energy, there is a lot of energy released, nor cold. Is it possible to call a process cold that proceeds at a temperature of 1000 degrees? The unsatisfactory terms used are obvious to all researchers of this phenomenon, but until the phys physical mechanism of this phenomenon is clarified, only conditional terminology is possible. Moving forward, we will use the popular term, both at home and abroad, Lena. So that's low energy nuclear reactions. Lena is very diverse. There are processes in metals with hydrogen dissolved in them. There are processes in plasma, in gas discharge, and even in biological systems. At first glance, these processes have uh, nothing in common. But on closer examinations, you will see four features that unite them. The first feature is that they have a quite tangible energy threshold. This is especially clearly seen in the example of nickel hydrogen reactors, in which intensive excessive heat generation occurs only at temperatures above 1200 degrees C. Now, uh, he's talking from experience, uh, or, or his own experience of when that occurs, and uh, uh, of those of others, i.e. when the uh, average energy of particles of a substance during thermal motion exceeds 0.1 EV. In electroplasma reactors, so two more uh, sources there, the temperature reaches several thousand degrees, and that's tenths of EV. In installations with plasma of glowing gas discharge, 5 and 6, the electron energy is of the order of 1 EV. At first sight, processes in which <coughs> Lena systems are detected at room temperature, electrolysis, biology, are an exception to this rule, but in fact it is the energies of the order of 1 EV that are characteristic of energy exchange acts in both electrochemistry and in the processes of cellular metabolism. The second feature is that Lena processes occur in fairly dense medium, solid, liquid or dense plasma. The third feature is the large variety of nucleides arising in the Lena process. The fourth feature is the absence or very low intensity of hard nuclear radiations, neutrons, gamma, quanta, uh, which it would seem should inevitably arise during nuclear transformations. These features can indicate the search path for the Lena physical mechanism. It is necessary to look for a mechanism that appears at energies greater than 0.1 EV, which gives a large variety of nucleides and where changes at the nuclear level do not cause the appearance of hard radiation. 
In addition, the mechanism sort must solve the problem of the Coulomb barrier, since energies of the order of 1 eV are completely insufficient to overcome it in the process of nuclear collisions. Uh, in a number of papers, it was suggested that in order to solve the problem of explaining Lenner, it is necessary to involve weak nuclear interactions, a whole bunch of sources. I will try to show that by taking this path, all the indicated features of Lenner can be explained. I would like to note that there is no Coulomb barrier in weak interactions. That's beta processes. Lenner threshold. The presence of neutrinos or antineutrinos is a necessary condition for nuclear transformations to occur due to weak interactions. Since neutrinos have a very small mass, at present it is believed that the mass of electron neutrino and antineutrino does not exceed 0.2 eV. They can, although with low probability, uh, result from inelastic collisions of particles of a substance, electrons, ions, neutral atoms, during their thermal motion. Generally, in inelastic collisions of particles, photons are produced, not neutrinos. If born photons have sufficient energy, they are unlikely to break up into a pair of neutrino antineutrinos. Since there is no exact data on neutrino mass, we will assume that the minimum energy for the formation of neutrino antineutrino pair is 0.5 eV. The average energy of 0.5 eV has a particle in a body heated up to 3200 degrees C. Let me remind you, and just, just hold that figure in mind, maybe I'll say something at the end. Um, uh, let me remind you that the average energy of thermal motion, it gives them an equation, is blah, blah, blah. Some particles have this and higher energy even at lower temperatures using the energy distribution function of particles during thermal motion. So he's saying even though something might be at a lower temperature, uh, it, there are areas, uh, statistically speaking, that will have much higher temperatures. Using the energy distribution function of particles during thermal motion, it is possible to find the temperature dependence of a fraction of particles with an energy higher than a given one. For a threshold energy of 0.5 eV, this dependence is shown in figure 1. At room temperature, the fraction of such particles is 10 to the minus 8. A noticeable fraction of particles with energy above 0.5 eV appears only at temperatures of about 1000 degrees C. At a temperature of 1600 degrees C, such particles are already 10%, and at a temperature of 4500 degrees C, 50%. Thus, under the assumptions made, the threshold of thermal generation of neutrino antineutrino pairs is about 1000 degrees C. Interesting, uh, because uh, we thought the Lyon reactor was only going just over 800 degrees, but in fact it was going about 1050, 1080 degrees. Okay, so this is the proportion of particles with an energy above 0.5 eV, depending on temperature. So up to about, sort of, around about 700 degrees, we start to get some. 1000 degrees, it starts to become something useful. Uh, and uh, 2,000 degrees, uh, we're getting a, a sizable portion. Okay, so the need for a dense environment. Currently, the level of knowledge about the properties of neutrinos is insufficient to reliably determine the probability of a neutrino and antineutrino formation during thermal collisions of particles of matter. It is clear only that the probability of this is small. A small probability is compensated by a large number of collisions. We estimate the number of collisions per second during thermal motion in metals. Most often, electrons collide with atoms in metals. The distance between collisions is 10 to the minus 8 meters. The speed of movement of electrons at a temperature of 2000 Kelvin, uh, about 2 times 10 to the 5 meters per second, uh, consequently, uh, an electron with its thermal motion experiences 2 times 10 to the 13 collisions per second. Given that the number of free electrons per centimetre cube of a metal is about 10 to the 23, we find that the number of collisions per second per centimetre cube of metal is 2 times 10 to the 36. So many collisions suggest that uh, in sufficiently hot metals, neutrinos and antineutrinos arise with an intensity sufficient to initiate nuclear transformations giving a significant energy release even with the very low probabilities of processes as, uh, associated with neutrinos. Suppose that only one of 10 to the 10 uh, antineutrino uh, and only one of 10 to the 10 neutrinos or antineutrinos uh, cause nuclear transformation. 
even with such huge losses, one centimeter cubed of hot metal produces two times 10 to the 16 nuclear transformations per second. In each act of such uh, transformations, uh, an order of one MeV is allocated. Since one joule is equivalent to 6.25 times 10 to the 12 MeV, the power of the energy released is about two kilowatts. We make a similar estimate for gas heated to uh, a temperature sufficient for thermal generation of neutrinos, several thousand degrees C. In a gas, even at such temperatures, electrons and ions are much smaller than neutral atoms, uh, molecules. Therefore, atoms and molecules uh, collide predominantly. The speed of their movement is of the order of 10 to 3 meters per second, and their path length before collision at atmospheric pressure is about 10 to the minus 7 meters. Therefore, an atom molecule experiences about 10 to the 10 collisions per second. One centimeter cube of hot gas at atmospheric pressure contains about 10 to the 19 atoms molecules. About 10 to the 29 collisions per second occur in it, which is seven orders of magnitude less than in metals. In uh, a gas heated to a temperature of several thousand degrees, Thermal generation of a neutrino and an antineutrino is possible, but occurs with an intensity that is many orders of magnitude lower than in metals. Intensive generation requires hot, dense medium with a high content of free electrons. In addition to metals, such a medium is a high-density plasma, which briefly arises. For example, during explosions of metallic conductors or at a sufficiently strong pulsed energy release in liquid. So with sort of exploding wires here and sort of classic Mizuno uh, electrolysis or electrolysis, pulsed electrolysis. So uh, then he goes on to the multinuclei interaction and uh, the variety of nucleides that arise. As indicated in these references, a huge variety of nucleides arising in the Lenner process can be achieved if several nuclei are involved in the interaction at once. A paper on computer computation of possible variants of energy-efficient nuclear transformations of two stable nucleides to two other stable nucleides involving electrons and neutrinos, antineutrino, in uh, which the laws of conservation of electric, baryon and lepton charges are fulfilled was reported in 13. Uh, this is what we've um, made into the uh, reaction tables. Um, considered rearrangements of nucleons with electron absorption. So this is taking an electron on board uh, using a neutrino process. And there's an example. Uh, so 60 nickel plus 1H plus an electron plus an antineutrino goes to uh, 4 helium and 57 iron plus uh, 0.569 MeV. And rearrangements of nucleons with the release of electrons. And so that's kind of like it, it's letting an electron out. So uh, uh, 61 nickel plus 64 nickel plus a neutrino goes to 63 copper plus 62 nickel uh, plus an electron 0.995 MeV. Uh, and then there's a huge number of variations uh, of reactions that came out of that calculation, and that's all in the Parkamov reaction table calculator. Processes associated with weak nuclear interactions are extremely unlikely if the neutrinos, antineutrinos participating in them have an energy of the order of 1 MeV or higher. Such neutrinos, antineutrinos, arise in beta decay processes or are generated at accelerators. But when they occur as a result of thermal collisions, the situation is much better. Such neutrinos or antineutrinos have a kinetic energy of no more than tenths of an EV. Unlike the nuclear neutrinos, they have a de Broglie wavelength significantly exceeding the interatomic distances. With a mass of 0.28 EV and a kinetic energy of 0.1 EV, the de Broglie wavelength is about 5 microns. This means that the interaction region covers a huge number of atoms of the order of 10 to the 13 in a solid or liquid substance, which makes possible transformations that capture many atomic nuclei, um, um, sorry, many atoms and nuclei, as a result of which even unlikely processes become uh, noticeable. So, uh, uh, you know, this is uh, basically saying the processes that uh, produce fast uh, uh, neutrinos, let's say, if they're coming from the sun, they're not going to readily cause uh, this uh, to occur because the most of them are extremely uh, high energy. Um, uh, and so the, the chances of them interacting are, interacting are negligible. And the same with accelerators, but uh, the normal way neutrinos are produced. But uh, ones that are synthesized through thermal interactions uh, above a certain threshold uh, fall into a category where the de Broglie wavelength it, it allows them to interact with many atoms at once. 
lack of hard nuclear radiation. In the described mechanism, the rearrangement of nucleons occurs with the introduction of energy, which could cause the excitation of nuclear levels, the emissions of which could lead to the emission of gamma rays. The deficiency of the introduced energy leads to the fact that all of the possible transformation variants, those that produce the most stable nuclei, which are not prone to alpha or beta radioactivity or emit neutrons, are realised. So basically, there's not too much energy going in, so there isn't uh, the energy to release in the form of uh, 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 hard radiation. Um, the released energy is realised in the form of the kinetic energy of the resulting nucleide. So fragments are made, uh, uh, sorry, elements exchange nucleons uh, 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 with the beta processes potentially involved, and then the the new nucleons, uh, so the new nuclei are uh, released, uh, uh, carrying away the uh, yielded energy. The released energy is realised in the form of kinetic energy of the resulting nucleides. Despite the fact that they can have energy up to several MeV, when they are braked, hard radiation does not occur, since massive charged particles lose their energy even at high energies, mainly as the result of ionisation and excitation of atoms of the medium in which they move. At the same time, electromagnetic radiation is emitted, but soft, with energy of quanta up to several keV. In addition, the emission of soft quanta occurs when the deformed electron shells uh, of the resulting nucleides are normalised. Conclusion Neutrinos are considered to be practically elusive, manifested only in the most complex experiments on huge installations, but it does not take into account that the properties of neutrinos at very low energies are just as different from those of nuclear neutrinos, for example, as light differs from, that's visible light I guess, differs from gamma radiation or helium gas differs from alpha particles. And the interaction of a huge number of atoms leads to a significant increase in the interaction of neutrinos with matter, uh, resulting in groups of many atoms being involved in nuclear transformations all at once. This makes it possible to explain a number of features of the Lenner process. So he's basically so, uh, uh, dealt with all of the major problems uh, with uh, low energy nuclear reactions. Uh, he's saying that uh, you know the, the kind of neutrinos that most people understand uh, are uh, very very far removed uh, from the neutrinos that are thermally produced that w are ordinarily never produced on Earth in most processes uh, until you get up to these very high temperatures. So the kind of temperatures you would see in that Indian arc furnace. Uh, which produced uh, three tonnes of excess silicon and one tonne of excess iron uh, per day uh, for 11 weeks, uh, which uh, uh, Mahadev and Srinivasan, you know, immediately when I'm seeing this theory, I'm saying, well, could this exp explain the atomic hydrogen uh, rec recombination uh, uh, excess energy that was observed by Langmuir. So if you imagine you've got a surface and, and the, the atomic hydrogen is coming together and it's fusing and it produces uh, the number of, of EV that that does, uh, this could, could the statistical variation uh, uh, on the target uh, surface, let's say it's glass or whatever, uh, produce temperatures, uh, highly localised temperatures that are in the range uh, sufficient to produce uh, 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 neutrinos and anti-neutrinos and those go ahead and do nuclear transformations on the atoms that's in the glass which you know for instance if it's borosilica glass you're going to have uh, boron you, you might have some lithium carbonate in there as a, uh, a flux uh, you obviously got silica and you've got oxygen and, and so forth there's, there's some potential reactions that could occur there that you could investigate through the Parkamov reaction tables and and so you actually get excess heat, and it's it, it is due to the recombination of the hydrogen, but it isn't just the yield of the recombination of hydrogen. And could that then go on to explain <clears throat> why uh, Mr. Amaza and uh, people with HHO uh, um, can uh, achieve uh, uh, seemingly uh, anomalous results? Uh, is is that related? To that is that why Mr. Amaza is so keen on knowing the the amount of atomic hydrogen that is in the gas, um, uh, uh, you know, and and do the neutrinos uh, that are synthesized do they uh, self-organize in in some way, uh, you know, so uh, uh, lead to some other observations that have been observed in the field. 
uh, do these things actually get generated in plasma pinches? Do they get generated in, um, you know, uh, uh, in, in the production of uh, tor toroids of electrons? So uh, I I'll say it right now. Um, I imagine you've got a, a fast discharge. You've got some shearing forces uh, uh, within the uh, electron cloud that's around the uh, um, uh, space charged distribution and you've got a shearing force as the discharge goes through uh, that creates your your donut your toroid that is self-confining it pinches down on itself and just like you're blowing air into a tire and it gets hotter and hotter this is pinching down as it as it's pinching down you're getting higher and higher densities of free electrons they're capturing ions they're all smashing together the temperature is going up because it's condensing does that then yield neutrinos through the collision of the materials? And then you, the, the, the torrid has not only got the, the electrons in there, it's got the neutrinos spinning around in the same kind of relative motions because they were synthesized by a whole cluster of material going around. And that, then that creates your, your EBO, which uh, in at least some forms, according to Shishkin, contains a lot of... Uh, uh, cold neutrinos and then that can go off and do work so you know um, are, are they the re related do you actually need to create the the evos or can you just create the uh, slightly more subtly um, would it be that you have a, a tip of metal and uh, the, the the space charge around that uh, and then uh, discharges from that uh, you know maybe between metal particles or interfaces or through anharmonic oscillations create the same effect and that leads to the pinching down it's basically like a plasma pinch when a plasma pinch is going you've got a lot of charge and electrons and ions they're they're going down in, through or up a, a, a charged channel just like lightning actually and and so he's basically saying that you know in in uh, in um, um, in metals, you've got far more electrons, and, and uh, uh, in in a small space, so you've got much higher chance at high temperatures of this occurring. Well, in a plasma pinch, that's exactly what you've got as well. And so, is that why when a, when a, a discharge, a, a spark hits a piece of metal, that you see uh, potential transmutations there? Hmm, interesting. I'll share this with the video, the, the, my English translation. The official English translation will be published again on the Journal of Emerging Areas of Science, or whatever it's called, uh, the same one that the Russian version is on here, uh, on, uh, what is it, uh, www.unconv-science.org. And so here is the Russian version. I think we're getting to a point where uh, we can understand this process and uh, what... Uh, and, dri and drives uh, potentially what, what's going on um, uh, in a wide range of uh, seemingly unrelated technologies. So uh, thank you very, very much for your time and I'll see you in the next video. Remember, we have uh, just updated the Parker Mob reaction tables and uh, we hope to be able to update that to include tritium uh, because tritium is uh, observed in Lena. So thank you very much for your time uh, uh, and I'll see you in the next video.